Welcome to Now is the Time. This, this program is a part of the International Association of Female Artists, which is an organization that provides a forum for women globally and gives a voice to artists of all media. Women artists have been the pollinators of culture, community for centuries and are often not seen or valued in visible ways in the art world. We hope that this global opportunity creates a new precedent to allow access or for allowing access to those who are often overlooked in countries around the world. So now is the time um, is a particular format committed to showcasing our members. And today we are going to have Barbara Bridges, who is a fabulous artist um, from uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. She originally is from Maine. And I have to say that I met Barbara many years ago when she was doing her Ode to Gluten project, one of many. Um, and she will talk to you about that. She is um, a, a fireball and uh, fun to listen to and watch in action. She's an incredibly creative artist in more than one way, as you will be able to see. And she combines her art and her space and her love and commitment to other people and the artists around her. Uh, Barbara has been an artist and a teacher and a teacher college professor for over 40 years. Her social practice sculptures have been exhibited in Maine, Miami, the Virgin Islands, Maryland, Chicago, Mexico, Spain, Canada, and throughout Minnesota. Bridges taught K through 12 art in Minnesota, Maine, and the Virgin Islands, and trained teachers in higher education at the University of Minnesota and Bemidji State University. Barbara creates social practice art from fabricated components in a variety of media and rescued power objects, as she calls them. She manipulates the objects to create training and provoke uh, discussions and reflection on a wide variety of social topics. She's also um, an intervener, Cambridge educated philosopher, uh, um, Tim Ingold holds an antique theory on art making and Dr. Ingold suggests that artists are simply interveners on any particular materials or objects the man, the artist manipulates. Any object already has a story. The artist simply recombines these objects to create a new narrative. Um, Barbara is also founder and director of Art to Change the World and I could say a lot more. I just am going to turn the program now over to Barbara. Welcome, Barbara, and thank you for being here. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm very honored to be here. And um, what I'm going to do is just show a little bit about um, Art to Change the World, show you a few examples of my practice, and then I'm going to go into how I let this influence me as I bought um, this $50,000 duplex that I'm living in and um, renovated it with no more money, but lots of imagination. So here we go. I think the easiest way to show you what Art to Change the World is all about is show you the newsletter that just came out today. We have um, a newsletter that's, that comes out every month that kind of tells our membership, which is about 400 people, what's going on in our organization. So I always try to do a little inspirational um, uh, uh, essay at the beginning. And this one is about Angela Duckworth's persistence and grit um, philosophy. She was a, um, Pen a University of Pennsylvania um, professor who did a study and found no correlation between high te test scores and success. She had identified persistence and grit as the essential qualities for success. So um, we have three different calls for art um, in this newsletter. This one is a December um, uh, exhibition that we're having down in a little gallery that was given to us in Solar Arts called the Fox Den. 
Uh, Laura Manhill is a diversity and inclusion coordinator. She always includes a message. Our SWAP um, initiative is a store in quotation marks that's very different. It's a relational store. So the artist agrees to adopt one other work on the site and then they can put three um, artworks on the site. ACW doesn't take any money. The buyers and the artists connect together and transfer the art. Uh, Leo McDill got an initiative going that we would give 10% from the summer until December to ACW of our sales. So here's the people um, doing involved in that. Here is um, one of our coaching project um, uh, youth who's do her name of her project is Blood on the Pavement. So she's calling for art. She's gonna write a dozen poems and then there'll be a dozen artists that create works to um, meet that. Uh, our member article, uh, Frame Your Rights exhibition um, about uh, social justice, which will be in November. Um, on location drawing group, I'll be going to that later today. Um, here's our volunteer staff, um, and I'm just thrilled that it's over a dozen people um, who are getting small stipends uh, to work um, on the pro on the Art to Change the World, studio visits, so you get the idea. So that's Art to Change the World. I'm really, really proud of it. I'm spending way too much time, as with anyone who starts an organization, as men can tell you, it just consumes you immediately. So <laughs> just get used to that. So here's um, descriptions of that Ellen just shared with you. I really do see myself as an intervener. I got interested in saving objects from landfill years ago, um, and I'm totally intrigued with the with the stories that each of these objects have. My main project right now is a healing project, um, and this cabinet, and you can see the drawers here. Um, all have, there's 26 of them, objects in it. So people come to the workshop. We have a licensed counselor, myself, and um, a survivor of trauma. And they go in those um, drawers and pick up the object that kind of resonates with them according to what their trauma was. And then we do a workshop and make art. I'm really um, pleased with this project and it's generated a lot of different um, kind of small works that are associated with it, like these higher power altars. If you've ever been involved with a 12 step program, they tell you, well, if you don't believe in God, that's okay, because um, you know, your higher power can be a do doorknob. So the, you can see there's a little doorknob up there. That's an, I got antique doorknobs and made these little higher power altars, just sort of a tongue in cheek thing. Um, I love making my steampunk furniture and I keep thinking I need to try to do something with it and get with a designer or an agent or something. So I take these uh, objects, old wood, old fences, old doors, old shutters and create, this is a triangle cabinet I created to go in a, an odd space um, in my house. And I really enjoy, um, again, saving these things from a landfill, combining them, uh, making them something new and something fabulous. So you can see they're all made to look like they're distressed, like you just stumbled onto them and they're 300 years old. And, um, and I, this includes my chairs. This chair got honorable mentions at the Minnesota State Fair, which I only understood was a big deal after I moved here to Minnesota. Um, but again, picked up all of this stuff off the beach. Um, you have beaches here in Minnesota, actually. I thought I was done with driftwood when I left um, Maine, but no. So I have a motion, motivational series and um, what's the big difference is about the holidays. Um, the big three, Islam, uh, Christianity and Judaism, all have festivals of lights. And um, it all started because the days were getting shorter and shorter and they said, oh, we need a ritual. We're gonna lose our lights. So they made the rituals and they did them and oh, they worked, the light came back and the days got longer. So it all started there, but for some reason, we all have to kill each other now over these small differences and these religions over the festivals of lights, which really annoys me. This is Ode to Gluten. This is a seven foot tall uh, sculpture uh, that I did looking at the wheat industry and the wheat processing industry here in Minnesota. And I actually got ConAgra to um, um, uh, call me about this project um, because I was kicking up enough of a, a fuss so they were, um, you know, intrigued with it. And so uh, that's what 
that one was. And Can't Watch It Away is an uh, artist, my weapon, Nikki McComb project. I looked at suicide by gun and homicide by gun. And there were way more suicides by gun than homicides by gun, which was just terrifying to me, made me feel so terrible. Um, be, growing up in Maine, I'm very interested in what's going on in our water and our oceans and the coastline. So I drove from Key West, um, F Florida to um, Fort Kent, Maine, all along the ocean on Route 1 and picked up objects, talked to the fishermen. Um, like this, I got out in Boston Harbor and picked up everything that you see here within 10 minutes. I could smell the chemical smell in Boston Harbor, but the sign that they had there was, oh, swimming was just fine. Um, so I looked at the whole coastline and um, that's what this project is. Um, Ellen knows this, this is um, Transcending Race, but not the 24 inch waist. This appeared in the Women and Money show at the Catherine Nass Gallery, probably the fanciest exhibition I shall ever be in. And many, many hundreds of hours of work from Ellen uh, leading that initiative. Um, the whole idea here is that, um, you know, you, it doesn't matter what color you are, but if you're a woman, you better have a 24 inch waist. And then lastly, um, this was uh, the Gorilla Girls uh, came to town um, and did a project with MCAD and the MIA. So I was involved with that. And this um, has a picture of the very first um, feminist writing that we have, which is in 1504. And it opens up like a Baroque European triptych and then shows things about the, um, uh, the Gorilla Girls. So that's a little quickie uh, trip through my art. And now I'm going to talk about the house. So here is my crazy house. I said earlier, I bought this for $50,000 and it was a horrible mess. I took three huge dumpster loads of stuff out of here and then um, did all new wiring and all new electrical. And then I had no more money. So I fixed it up, recycling, repurposing and creating. And um, I painted it, the colors of Mexico, which inspires me, which is where I live in the wintertime. I kind of tried to go for a cottage in the woods that had been there for a hundred years look. And in Maine, I made all kinds of uh, driftwood uh, railings. Um, and so I just kind of used that same thing. And here's an archway that I run uh, morning glories up, et cetera. These are African marigolds. I would recommend that you plant these. They're lovely, they're four feet tall. They're still blooming outside here. So you, you have them all summer long. Uh, I, um, I have a real compost pit um, like I used to. I used to have an acre garden. I was a back to the lander. Uh, and um, so you get lots of volunteers and I let them grow. So I got a little volunteer um, uh, melon. These uh, resin, I do a lot of resin and I'll show you that in a minute, uh, castings that I use in my artwork. And so I was doing Ode to Gluten when I created this house and um, I decided I was gonna have a wheat, wheat motif on the front. So that's what I did. Uh, love these giant mailboxes. I do live right here in Northeast Minneapolis and sometimes um, packages disappear. So it's nice to, to have this. This is a wonderful bronze sculpture that um, I bought at the St. Paul Garden Show. If you go to these big garden shows on Sunday afternoon, um, they want to get rid of things. They don't want to haul them out of there. So usually you can um, get them for a pretty reasonable deal. This is one of my garden sculptures um, that is um, uh, meant for all the, I have lots of people walking by the house. I live two blocks from Edison High School. And as so I, people, I'm encouraging people to stop and put their face into the sun. I love these Adirondacks. I was in Maine, as you know, uh, for many years and 37 years right on the coast of Maine. And I, every two or three years, I had to replace all my Adirondacks because they would rot. So I went uh, to the dark side, some people would think, and I buy these comfort crafts. Well, I never have to buy them again because they're lifetime guaranteed. Um, you can just Google them. There's three or four places and um, they're not cheap. This is about $200. This rocker is about $300. But once you get them, that's it. You don't have to bring them inside. Um, they're there. I really encourage everybody to do random acts of kindness. It makes you feel good. It makes the people feel great. They get these things. So again, I live right on um, the street and I will put these things out and they will be gone within a couple of hours. 
in, um, in my little 20 by 30 foot garden plot I have on my front yard, I manage, I have very little sun to get quite a bit of stuff out of here. And any uh, Mainers who are listening to this will be horrified because you would never see a high bush blueberry in Maine. But I managed to get about 20 quarts off these seven bushes that I have um, right in my front yard. So peonies, yeah, who can, who can not love peonies, right? Hi, Jill, welcome. Well, thank you. <laughs> so um, you missed me showing Ode to Gluten. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, Jill was my mentor when I was working on Ode to Gluten. And so I just showed that very quickly. So um, I grow strawberries in these um, canvas um, bags, which um, you can buy on, from any garden store, pretty cheap. Um, and, um, and I move them around to get the sun. I also believe in using rainwater instead of the hose um, to water as much as I can. So I run all my gutters into this rain barrel and use it for that. Here's a little door um, stopper on my gate um, that I um, created from a pulley off one of the tall chips from Maine, an Austrian bell that I got when I was in Austria that they put on the cows, and then old rotten rope. I pick old rotten rope up on the beaches of Maine. I just love it. A uh, big stand of raspberries. And then uh, people think that you need to have all this fancy underground watering. You don't. This is $30 for one of these. And you can see I have a splitter and I just have the hoses all running and I have it set so it comes on for half an hour every day. So I don't even have to think about it. Uh, these pink hydrangeas are fabulous. They're called Anna Roses, and um, you can see uh, you, you pick them and they stay pink all winter. I'm a big um, uh, visitor of Savers every Tuesday. If you're over 55, you can go to Savers and get 40% off every Tuesday. So it's one of my rituals. I go there and um, I just feel so happy. I come out of there with a $20 patio set or beads to work on some of my necklaces with, et cetera. Um, I just want to, every, any artists who are listening, um, consider doing this. I went to visit Zoran's studio with two of my friends, my history friends who knew my whole story. And, um, and they, of course, loved his work and it's monumental and it's gorgeous. And he, he was in a great mood that day. He took us inside and offered us coffee. And right up over my shoulder was this little sculpture, which is a heart with a stake through it. And so my friend said to him, so what's that? And he said, oh, that's my um, heart with a stake. I, that's St. Cloud granite. So anybody that knows me knows that's where my horrible, horrible divorce from my childhood sweetheart happened. And so my friend said, oh, you've got to have that, Barbara. And I said, no, no, I can't afford Zoran's work. No way. Oh, and Zoran said, oh, I'll give you a deal. And I said, you could give me the deal of the century and I still can't afford your work. So he said, all right, I'll sell it to you for um, $2,000 and you bring me uh, money once a month. So I paid, I bought this sculpture from Zoran. I have an original Zoran and I went there and paid him once a month. And I've thought through the years, you know, we should have an initiative like that in ACW. So, cause I would love to have some beautiful works but I can't afford um, that. Here's a piece that's part of the water project called, um, it's called Treasures of the Inland Sea. So um, the, this is uh, objects I picked up up on Lake Superior, in the, uh, on Lake Superior. and um, I use it as a kind of a little divider on my tool shed. Um, but this is what it looked like when I had it in the warm show. I'm making lots of garden sculptures now, again, using all of this recycled stuff. I found this out on the sidewalk in front of somebody's house. They had cut all these things out. Um, and I like that piece a lot. Um, so the backyard is, is quite the little oasis. I bought this house partially because I knew I could make a nice backyard. Climbing rows. Um, here's my grandmother's bleeding hearts. You kind of think there might be a God when you see stuff like this, you know? I mean, just look at how gorgeous those are. Unbelievable. So um, I had a situation dealing with um, somebody in my life that needed uh, to, to recover from trauma. And we built this uh, waterfall fountain together. Uh, so you, um, I shock it so it's not hot, but you can get in and on a hot summer's day and enjoy it. 
And uh, that person wrote this poem. It was very moving and they recovered. So I really felt as though us working on this in installation together helped in ways that sitting around a counseling table never did. I like the title, Your Trauma is Not Terminal. Yeah, everybody thinks it is because particularly when you're dealing with opiate addiction and things like that, it's just so horrific and it's so dangerous that you think, I'm never going to get out of this, but you can. So, um, you know, everybody admires my gardens and they always say, oh, you have a green thumb. No, I just know how to rot vegetables. <laughs> so this isn't brain surgery here. Um, compost works. So I take all my scraps, all my garden refuse, and it's a three bin thing to do it right. These tumblers and those things never work. You put them in here first. Once they're sort of half rotten, then you move them into this one and then you move them into the, the, the finished one um, before you use it. And you need one of these old fashioned pitchforks to um, turn them over. I'm really big on, I love concrete and tile together. And it's of course so cheap to make planters by using that. And then I get that Spanish moss and sort of embed it. So, because again, I'm always going for that. Oh, it's a hundred years old and it's been sitting here all that time, look. Uh, made a fire pit in my backyard. This is my son and his wife and my little step-grandson. And um, just a, a little hint, I kept getting fined because when I, I was, before I sold my house in Maine, I was there for three or four months. And I was fined because I wasn't mowing my alley. So I went and looked. And if you have a memorial prairie, if you have a naturalized prairie, they can't fine you. So I went and planted all these prairie plants and that's, it's just been great. And now it's looking pretty good out there actually, but I don't have to think about it anymore because it's a prairie. Interesting. Yeah. So here's my wood shop. I have two buildings. This was an old goat coal shed at the turn of the century. Um, and I don't like doing my wood stuff in with my other stuff because the sawdust gets all over everything. So um, as you can see, I never met a rotten board I didn't like. <laughs> And uh, again, I, I, these, I just, I love these. I, I run my hand over this and the story, I mean, this is a hundred year old fence. So imagine what that fence had seen and it's just so beautiful and there's no way you could take new wood and make it look like this. And um, I have a big commission I'm gonna be doing in Mexico, a uh, duality niche with a lady of Guadalupe and a Cortina uh, Day of the Dead figure um, that spins. And I'm going to take some of this wood for the outside of it um, down there for that. So here's just a picture of my messy, messy studio and some of the cast resin stuff that I, I just, I love take, casting this resin and then again, distressing it to make it look like it had you know been around forever. Um, here's the beads um, for a lot of the work that I do that supports the healing project so different necklaces and ranklets and bracelets and it, what I found is that if someone can have something small they can take away to remind them you know what this what the strategies were and um and I've got to tell you collecting and sorting is part of the art form and the you know being on the hunt getting it and then keeping it sorted by color um, this is the Ukrainian embassy called me and they wanted to bring this group that was touring the museums over to my studio. And I said, I need to send you the website so you can see what this is. I mean, I'm thinking, why would they want to come? So they came and then this woman and this woman, we're still in contact. This was like seven years ago. Um, and they keep wanting me to come to Ukraine, but I'm thinking probably not the best place for me. Uh, so downstairs, um, again, no money to renovate with. So I bought, got all these uh, tiles at recycle places and, you know, the Habitat for Humanity, et cetera. Smashed them up, created um, uh, different um, designs, uh, something a little more conservative here in the bathroom. And then 
uh, before I take you upstairs to my apartment, and many of you have been in here, so you know what I'm talking about. I moved a 5,000 square foot house, then a 3,000 square foot house into my apartment, my 1,000 square foot apartment. And I thought to myself, okay, I need to get a storage room or something because I can't fit all this in here. But then I thought I'm 70. Why should I shut my memories away just because it's not cool to cover every square inch and considered bad taste? So I, I didn't. And so you can see uh, every square inch is um, uh, covered in here. So at my kitchen table are these uh, chairs that I created. And um, again, all found objects would have gone to a landfill, half the stuff. This one all off the, uh, the waterways of Minnesota. This one, um, uh, Mexican, Maine, Asian. Uh, I love to play with every material there is. So even though I'm not a ceramicist, um, uh, continental clay has been so good to me. They let me bring clay home and create these things and um, then I bring them back and they fire them. So that's what I did for that. So this is um, from a series called La Mujer and the, that's the lady in um, Spanish. I was really interested as I traveled around to big and small towns, the imagery I kept seeing was of women. And this is supposed, Mexico is supposed to be a misogynistic country. And so I started doing a hit count. How many times did I see Lady of Guadalupe? How many times did I see Frida Kahlo? And what was interesting to me is um, Lady of Guadalupe first, Frida Kahlo second, and get this, uh, Snow White third. Uh, at, least they, at least she had dark hair, so I felt better about that. But Pancho Villa and the, you know, the Mexican heroes were distant, distant, distant um, behind these women. So I got really interested in who's really got control and what's it look like on the face of it all. So I created um, a lot of these uh, Lady of Guadalupe niches that has all this hidden feminist stuff in it. And um, I always make these big show necklaces, I call them, um, to wear to the opening because then people go, oh, I love your necklace. And I say, well, come right on over here and let's talk about feminism, you know, make them go over to the, to the work that I've got there. So here is some of the Lady of Guadalupe um, and uh, the La Mujer series. Uh, when you buy these old duplexes, uh, central heat is a real problem. There aren't enough room in the walls to run um, hot air. It's about $30,000 to put the water in. So I couldn't do any of that. So I bought a Vermont casting fireplace for each unit. And that's the, that's the main source of heat. I figure if you're gonna pay for flame, why not see it, right? And um, so I sit there, this is, my, um, this is where I run Art to Change the World on my little uh, TV tray in my, ch <laughs> in my chair. <laughs> um, window quilts out of, um, uh, I just got a big quilt up at Savers for $10 and then created these window quilts so I can pull them down on a cold, cold day. These old houses, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty bad. So I showed you a picture of this cabinet um, that's in this triangle space um, that I created out of the, all the found objects and it's got um, stained glass on the top of it. Wow. Um, uh, I don't know if any of you have been to Frida Kahlo's house, Casa Azul, but she has a bedroom full of Day of the Dead and masks. So I probably have about 30, 40 Mexican masks and I have them all in my bedroom. So here they all are. Um, the kitchen, uh, the, my splurge was this granite countertop um, and then everything else was out of recycled places. So these, all these cabinets were only $500 and I had an actual carpenter come and install them. So um, they're all going great. And here I am putting the lobster feed on. Um, I don't know if you know what soda stream is, but I like to have a treat and I don't want to get all that plastic going and going and going. So I, if you have one of these soda streams, you use, you know, your own filtered water and then you can put a couple tablespoons of blueberry juice or organic uh, juice. And so you're controlling what's in it. You're not dragging all kinds of plastic in and out of the house. And you think you, you, you convince yourself you have a treat. 
So um, I told you I didn't want to shove all my memories away. So I this was the the place had been partially renovated, so the walls were open, and I kept thinking when I looked at these, oh my gosh, that's kind of beautiful. So I ended up um, using some of the recycled lumber and making the horizontals in here, and it's a little place for all my little trivets and rocks and things that I've collected over the years. Um, if you have a chance to, um, uh, like tile makers, like Josh Blanc, uh, Leo McDill's um, husband is a tile maker and he sells seconds. So these were from the Strong Gallery in Maine and he did huge installations that were maybe 20 by 15 feet. And I was in a um, antique store one day and there was a box of uh, tiles and I pulled them out and I realized immediately these were seconds and leftovers for some of his things. So I created just a little um, uh, tile installation there from his works. So on to my crazy uh, bathroom. Um, all I remember of, when you were doing that. Yeah, I lived in the Caribbean for five years and picked up all of these gorgeous shells, which were in a box for, you know, 25 years. And when I made this bathroom, I thought, let's get these puppies out. And so this is like, obviously, a, um, a, a sea uh, water theme i've got river rocks those beautiful river rocks here uh, you can see them better here um, with the subway tile which i got at a recycle place um, i use that uh, art nouveau um, paint to make it look like it's bronze uh, to put over the wood and he, again this is the sea creature you know water coming out of the shower uh, stuff I think this is my last. That? Did you design that yourself? Yep, I did it. I used, I put the plywood, you know, on two saw horses and then just do most of it and then, uh, you know, install the panel. I'm talking um, about it, the tile itself. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, amazing. The, the, the design on the tile is just amazing. Thank you. <laughs> I, uh, I really do enjoy them. But each time I finish one, it's like climbing a mountain. It's like, that is the last time I'm doing that. And then I'll forget how intense it was. I mean, because your back hurts and your fingers hurt and you cut your fingers. And, and here's a few more of my little feeble attempts. You know, I just, I do love working with clay. There's something so um, permanent about it. You know what I mean? So now you're going to think I'm totally crazy. Um, I these are, these again are some of these custom um, these uh, uh, Adirondacks. These are the the fancy swivel things, and um, I have a little deck in this apartment. And I kept trying to grow vegetables, and the squirrels would not let me have anything. The second it started to get ripe, they were in there, and then they would be digging in the dirt and ripping the plants up, and I couldn't do anything. And I got, I mean, I tried this and I fur and spray and urine, and I mean, everything that's out there, nothing kept those squirrels away. And out of exasperation, I was so, this is during the, pan, before the pandemic, I had my handyman build me a cage. So he caged me in, and so they couldn't get in there. And so I have, I have loved it because I can grow everything. I, you know, it all covers and, um, you know, makes a big shelter for me in there. And um, yeah, so I love it. Um, here's a crazy thing my daughter uh, got going. She gets one of the shoe things and starts her greens in it. And so you can have greens in May because I start them inside, then I put them outside, put a little bubble wrap on them. And um, yeah, you can, you can get them pretty quick. So you see how how much that grew in with that fence. Here's an asparagus bean. I don't know if you've ever grown those, but they're fabulous. They're over a foot long. I also use it for clothes. <laughs> I, can, I dry my clothes out there too, so I don't, you know, use the dryer during the summer. The sun's coming in, you might as well do it. Um, so, um, Art to Change the World, uh, during the pandemic, we made masks uh, for essential workers and gave them away, and then some people bought them so we could buy more supplies and make more masks. Um, so Sally was, uh, uh, this is one of our board members, she was um, totally uh, supportive of that. So I got to change this because now we got over 400 members, um, but um, that's kind of the, the presentation. 
Um, any anyone have any questions? So I have a question because I'm particularly interested in the way in which you use your recycled items to create something. Um, the it seems like um, when I'm looking at the object, the object has so much to it. Um, you know, just even one necklace or one piece, just to be able to look at it and look and see where each one of those things came from. And, you know, it just seems very rich. So I almost felt like I wanted to kind of stop you and have you focus on one thing and show how, what are the tracings of that particular piece back to its found place? Mm -hmm. um, so because there, you have so much and it's almost like um, there's, there's, there are so many connections. It's like they go back, I don't know, hundreds a of years. A lot of times, um three quarters of the objects that are in the piece have some sort of meaning, thematic meaning that speaks to the theme of the piece. Other times I'm just trying to create a pattern with the objects um, on them. And I don't know, there's something very meditative for me about screwing 800 screws into a piece, you know, over and over and over, or dot, 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 or adding multiples. Um, I have tried, I have a really busy mind and I have a hard time shutting it off. I've tried meditating and I can, I can focus on that some being for like 30 seconds and that's it. Like it's torture for me. I, I, I can't stop. But when I'm making this art form, I'm in the zone. I don't think about anything except what I'm doing. And, and um, it's you know, your meditation. It's, it's a med it's my it's my meditation and lately I've done some pieces that aren't quite as busy and I mean they're much more elegant they are much more in line with what we think of as good formal elements and principles of design but they're not half as satisfying for me to make so there you go <laughs> um, and so I I my heart had always been in social justice work and social practice work and so Jill helped me figure it oh yeah that's what I want to do and it was good it got me focused right away on what feeds my heart and soul and really started me thinking about starting ACW so hard to change a world did you tell them the story about me coming to your studio that first time when I said no I, I had been creating in in privacy um, and really hadn't shown anybody what I was doing um, and I knew that it was out there and edgy and it wouldn't appeal to just anybody. And so I made the Ode to Gluten most of it before Jill, before anybody ever saw it. And this big six foot piece about the, like I said, about the grain industry. And um, so she came in the studio and I said, is this a piece of shit? Is that what you're talking about? Yes. <laughs> because I didn't know. <laughs> She, she said to me, do you think this piece is shit? And I said, Barbara, when I'm done with you, I don't ever want to hear you ask that question again. <laughs> you know, because her work was so good. And it just infuriated me that um, particularly women have this sense that their work isn't any good because we're not validated. You know, I mean, if Barbara had been a man, she would be rich and famous just on her work, you know, not because she was a good educator. Um, and I mean, you know, she certainly has notoriety now, but back then, you know, very few people knew who she was as an artist. And so um, I just remember yeah. looking at that piece and thinking, oh my God, why would anyone even ask that question? Well, that's here's why, Jill. What we're here's Here's why, because my ex-husband referred to my art as that funky shit. And then my studio in Maine was right near the road. So, I mean, I had been there for 37 years. So everybody knew me very well. And I had painted landscape paintings that they had in their living rooms. You know, I can do realistic painting. And uh, they would walk by and see me making this stuff. And that's what they would say. What? 
well, you can paint that those beautiful paintings. Why are you making this shit? They would say to me. So, yeah, no, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, it's funny because I have a um, drawing that I did of myself where I look really angry and my eyes are all squinty uh, because a guy had walked into the gallery and he said, um, he, he said that, he says, what is all this funky shit? And I looked at him and, you know, and I said, art. And so in the drawing, the whole background is like 200 ways of writing art, 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 art. You know, because people, they do, they don't think that this is your work. This is what I spend my life doing. And you waltz in here and just say that to me because they don't feel, they don't realize that you have an emotional commitment to this. Mm -hmm. yeah. no I, I think it's more that. than that. I, I think it's just beyond, they don't see value. And I think that that is what we're dealing with is the whole idea of value and success in our society. And so when someone just assumes they don't see purpose or value in what you're doing, um, they just make an assumption that that's and classify it into that category. And, well, and it's tied to money, Ellen. It's tied to money. How much money can you get somebody to give you for one of these works? That, right. that validates you, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, uh, Mung and I have had some conversations when we go to museums and stuff about um, how uh, the whole value of art and how someone like Jeffrey Koons can uh, produce something that somebody else made and and create yes, have it created by somebody else or fabricated by somebody else and then bring it to a museum and can, and then it will uh, make millions of dollars um and how um that apparently is valued and the artists that are um not seen and not heard from that produce works I, i'm thinking of you barbara but i'm also also thinking of one of the artists that we had almost the early, really early on on IAFA, a Chinese artist who is in New York right now who did a wall of um, breasts, are they, made out of um, cloth and I mean probably 80 feet long and the whole idea that this, this piece and the statement that you make made was very powerful, but essentially not necessarily valued by those people who looked at it or were making statements on, on art. Yet we can have an artist like Jeffrey Koons bring in a toaster um, and it's manufactured by somebody else. And then he puts it into a, you know, cubicle and it somehow has stature. So who's, who decides who, how do we decide that that's valuable? It's, it's a very, very important and interesting question that we are hoping that we can address. And Barbara's work to get back to Barbara is um, yeah, hours of, and years and energy behind and thought and heart behind um, many of the items that she brings in to create and put together and, um, and then create something else with them. And, but we don't somehow value that. And, and what, what does that say about us? What you're doing, Barbara, with Art to Change the World is really a, a clear path, a clearer path for artists because you aren't really taking anything. Um, you're just it, giving people formats for- It's been an uphill, it's been an uphill, it's been an uphill slog though. I mean, to, when we first started and we tried to say, get this idea about the relational versus the transactional, and we said, so this is going to be different. We're not taking a percentage, but in order to be in this store, you have to adopt a, a work from one of your uh, colleagues who is in this store. That's your entrance fee. And um, then you get 100% of whatever sales that you make, okay? You can't even imagine what I went through at the beginning 
they were just so resistant to that. No, they didn't want to do that. And there were things, Lael's magnets were on there. You could, you could buy her magnets for $30 and they wouldn't even do that, Ellen. So, I mean, it was an uphill slog. Now we seem to have, because people are seeing, you know, they're selling $600 works off there, um, that it's working. But it was not, when you try to change the paradigm, you know, it's, it's hard. It, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think people are so used to galleries um, taking advantage of them that they figure there's got to be what's the trick? Exactly. You know, how am I how am I being scammed here instead of seeing it as whoa, this is a whole new system? You know. Yeah. It. it what we're talking about kind of reminds me of the whole mail art concept, and I mean M A I L, where they just said we're just going to avoid the galleries altogether. You know, we're going to create this subterfuge system where we don't even go through the gallery. We just mail our work directly to a show. And then that show is put up. Everybody's work is seen. Everybody's given credit. Everybody gets a catalog. And then the show is over. And whoever created the show keeps the work. Um, but it can be shown again. And the idea is that you get to have a show, but you don't have to be uh, deemed good enough by some gallery. It's if your work shows up, your work is in the show. And so I think there is some value to that idea of working around the galleries and especially as women artists. I mean, we really haven't had much choice. That's what Warm was created. You know, that's why Second Wave, Women's Caucus for Art, Art to Change the World. It's all about creating a different system that works for us, you know, and us can be women artists, all artists, because uh, there are so many artists that never get to be part of the system. Well, one of the things that I have found encouraging, um, uh, I've been on the grant trail, this is grant season, so I've just been grinding them out and grinding them out. And you know, they have the boxes to check for all the different marginalized group. Guess what's just appeared in the past two or three months? There's a box to check for elderly. I'm not making this up. So they're, they're seeing us as a marginalized group now. <laughs> Whoever thought age would be an advantage. Let's rock the older years. I actually, when I started seeing that, I thought, I mean, I think we talked about this, Jill, is having some sort of project focused on aging. I mean, that the, the time is now for sure. And there are so many people with um, the time and the treasure that we could engage on with this on this topic, but uh, particularly now that it's being seen as a marginalized group, we can also get funding for it too. Yeah, right. There are three women who've been doing that for over a decade, and I'm trying to remember now. Oh gosh, I know who they are, and I just can't think of their names because I was up most of the night. Um, if it comes to me, I'll send it to you. But they did a lot of work together as a trio, and mm. they they called themselves like old ladies to make art or something. It was just old lady art. Anyway, I got such a kick out of that because, you know, you, you're just naming it what it is. And their yeah. work was really beautiful. Yeah. And honey, I'm so happy you joined us, but it started at nine. Ann Kleinhens, can you hear me? I don't think she's on audio. Yes. Ann, can you hear me, Ann? I think her audio has problem. I couldn't see. Yeah, I think uh. um, she was on an email that I sent this morning that that to some East Coasters that said ten o'clock for East Coast, oh. and she must have thought it meant ten o'clock for her. So, oh. so it's a little warm sisters reunion, Jill. Isn't that sweet? Yeah. Where's Jennifer and uh, you know who? Yeah. <laughs> hey, <laughs> our infamous younger sister. <laughs> Well, have we done our, uh, have we anything else you want to talk well, about? Or? I think, well, we, we are now at 10 o'clock and mm -hmm. I think that um, we have um, had a wonderful morning and uh, I think we could go on with this conversation. I, I really enjoyed kind of um, hearing some of the stories and stuff like that from you, Barbara, and want to thank you for taking the time and effort to actually put this uh, show together and, um, 
and do um, such a fabulous job with it. And your house is amazing. It's just full of, I've been there. So I've actually been able to see some of the work in person, but it's just, um, just really interesting how you honor the energy of the I don't know, of the what do you call it the found object found, yeah I I actually Jill helped me um, figure out the name for those and I we call them power objects because they have a whole narrative before I ever touched them they have a whole right. story I just combined them to make a new narrative you know is yeah. the way that and, I see it and yeah. um, having been uh, in an in industry where um, people uh, and seeing people uh, who've collected so many things and sometimes don't honor what they collect. Um, uh, it's really um, very interesting to see people who actually um, have value and really um, kind of showcase it in a way that it really has the, um, the energy that- Well, is what I try fire. to say, yeah, there's some schlocky found object work out there for sure. What I try to say to people is, you know, uh, bad craftsmanship does not honor a fabulous and important message, you know, and so the craftsmanship is, I think, important and how you put it together and other people have been and been inspired, they're going to go make something and and all of you know, there's more to it than just sticking stuff together. I mean, I did take a few design courses here and there. So, I, yeah, it's, um, yeah, I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's where my heart is for sure. Uh, so, well, I'm honored that you invited me to come and thank you so much. And um, you have a great day.